Hi, good morning. Okay, I actually seeing a lot of familiar names on our participants. Uh, I think other attendees are from our previous event that ha that happened last February, and this is actually a hybrid of attendees for our employees as well. So welcome again and good morning. It's Happy Tuesday. So today is we're going to talk about data privacy at managing risk and compliance. So we actually invited. Um, Carpolo and Associates to be partner with us on this wonderful webinar, and we hope that you'll learn a lot from this event. So let's start. We have a few some house rules here. First is kindly change your Zoom name to name plus your company name, and you could do that by clicking the participants icon and hovering your cursor or hand over the name and choosing rename. Please do this because we will only identify the attendees if we could see your name against our list so we could send a copy of the deck. So please do it so. And second is you may turn up your webcam during the pre presentation. Keep yourself muted unless speaking or engaging in conversation to reduce background noise or noise, noise pollution. Last one is use the raise hand feature if you want to speak or ask question once the Q&A portion had been started. Please ask your questions concisely. You could actually type your questions during the webinar on our Q&A portion, and we will address all those questions at the portion of the Q&A. Okay. So um, once again, we just like to introduce who we are. We are in Corp Philippines, um, um, formerly known as Kitalson and Carpo Consulting Inc. What we do is a corporate solutions provider here in the Philippines. We have a regional presence in Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Vietnam, India, and Australia. Uh, we do incorporation, corporate compliance, product registration, taxation, immigration, recruitment, business advisory, payroll and HR services, and corporate recovery. So just in case you will need anything from these services, feel free to reach out to anyone here in Incorp. Okay, our partner today is Carpolo and Associates. Um, Carpolo is a specialist corporate law firm that assists local and foreign enterprises with inbound foreign investment towards doing business in the Philippines. They are assisting small to medium sized and even multinational company as of now. Their practice area and expertise uh, is corporate and commercial, corporate tax, intellectual property, real estate, labor law, litigation, and family. Okay, let's start this webinar. We actually invited Attorney Edrin Jeff F. Huntilla Katakutan, or we call her Attorney EJ for short. Uh, she is a senior associate and a litigation and corporate lawyer of Carpolo and Associates. She has an extensive experience as a DPO from well-known organization and participated to different conferences and trainings led by the NPC, or National Privacy Commission. Her practice area is litigation, regulatory compliance, data privacy, labor, and contracts. She completed her legal management degree at Far Eastern University in Manila and finishes her law school at University of Batangas, Lipa City. And she's an IBP member since 2016. I'm going to give the floor to Attorney EJ. Can we give her a virtual round of applause? Hi, Attorney EJ. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you start sharing the screen now, Shirley? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'll give the floor to Attorney EJ. Okay. Morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. So we'll talk about Data Privacy Act. Okay. So to start, uh, what is the right to privacy? The right to privacy is enshrined in our constitution and in our laws. It is defined as the right to be free from unwarranted exploitation of one's person or from intrusion into one's private activities in such a way as to cause humiliation to a person's ordinary sensibilities. It is the right of an individual to be free from unwarranted publicity or to live without unwarranted interference by the public in matters in which the public is not necessarily concerned. Simply put, the right to privacy is the right to be let alone. It is also said that the right to privacy is the beginning of liberty because if you don't have privacy, then you really consider yourself as a free man, right? If you know that you're constantly being watched. Republic Act 10173, otherwise known as the Data Privacy Act of 2012, is a Philippine law that aims to protect the fundamental human right to privacy, especially in relation to personal data. The law regulates the collection, use, storage, processing, 
and dissemination of personal information by entities, including the government in both the public and private sectors. The DPA consists of 37 sections. Sections 1 to 6 is about definitions and general provisions. Section 7 to 10 is, the national pri- is about the National Privacy Commission. Now, the National Privacy Commission is the government agency that was created by law to enforce and administer the provisions of the DPA. Sections 11 to 21 contains the, the rights of data subjects and obligations of personal information controllers and processors. We'll talk about this more later. Sections 22 to 24 are provisions specific to government because, as mentioned, the DPA does not apply only to the private sector. It also applies to government agencies. Now, sections 25 to 37, last but definitely not the least, is about the penalties. Okay. Okay. So what is a data subject? Under the DPA, the data subject refers to an individual whose information is being processed. So question. If, is a corporation considered as a data subject under the DPA? The answer is no. So as far as the Data Privacy Act is concerned, only natural persons are considered as data subject. So when you do your data consent forms, if your customer is a corporate client, then there's no need to put the data privacy, or I mean, there, actually there's no need to use the data privacy consent form if your client or customer is a is a corporation because they are not considered as lead subject under the DPA. Consent of the data subject. Now, the consent of the data subject must be freely given, must be specific, and it must be evidenced. The law requires that the consent must be evidenced by written, electronic, or recorded means. Implied consent is not a valid consent under the DPA. When the law requires the consent of the data subject, the PIC must obtain consent in accordance with the DPA. Otherwise, they're under risk of facing penalties, complaints, and uh, bad reputation. Now, personal information refers to any information from which the identity of an individual is apparent or can be reasonably ascertained, or when put together with other information, would directly and certainly identify an individual. So, for example, name, address, phone number, email address, signature, photographs. Those are considered as personal information under the law. We have personal information and we also have sensitive personal information or the SPI. Uh, Sensitive personal information refers to an individual's race, ethnic origin, marital status, age, color, religious, philosophical, or political affiliations. It also includes about individual's health, education, genetic or sexual life, any offense committed or alleged to have been committed, um, issued by government agencies peculiar to an individual, including social security number, um, licenses, tax returns, and other information specifically established by an executive order or an act of Congress to be kept classified. Now, why is it important to distinguish between personal information and sensitive personal information? The reason is because sensitive personal information requires higher form of protection as its misuse may cause real and serious harm to the data subject. For example, uh, the data subject may face discrimination or suffer discrimination as a result of uh, the breach of his or her sensitive personal information. Now, since the sensitive personal information requires higher form of protection under the law, privacy breach involving sensitive personal information or SPI also entails higher penalties under the law. Personal information controller or PIC. Now, the PIC is the person or organization who controls the collection holding, processing, or use of personal information. So basically, these are the organizations or the entities that holds our information. The PIC, however, uh, for you slide, please. The, the PIC, however, excludes a person or organization who performs such function as instructed by another person or organization. So for, for example, uh, an employee within an organization who is actually involved in the processing of personal information or personal data 
is not considered as a PIC. The PIC is still the organization itself. Also, another exemption from this is an individual who collects, holds, processes, or uses personal information in connection with the individual's personal, family, or household affairs. So kung ganun lang yung extent, hindi siya considered as PIC. Personal Information Processor or PIP. Now, the person or organization qualified to act as such to whom a personal information controller may outsource the processing of personal data pertaining to a data subject. The key word is outsource. So classic example is call center outsourcing. Call center is considered as the PIP, while the company that engaged its services is the PIC. As a PIC, how do you manage your data privacy risk when you engage a PIP? Among the steps that you can take to ensure that the uh, uh, PIP is compliant with the data privacy so that your uh, privacy risk is um, managed or controlled is by making sure that the outsourcing agreement contains safety provisions. So uh, another thing that you can look at is whether this PIP has conducted their privacy impact assessment. Uh, first, do they have a DPO? Are they registered with the NPC? Because if if the answer is yes, then you can rest assured that you know your privacy, the data privacy of your customers is in good hands. Okay. What are your obligations under the Data Privacy Act? Number one is adherence to the three data privacy principles. Okay. First data privacy principle is transparency. How do you comply or how do you demonstrate transparency. By putting up data privacy notice or a data privacy policy to inform the data subjects about the processing of their personal data. Second, data privacy principle is legitimate purpose. So of course, you only process personal information for legal purposes. Number three is proportionality. So how do you demonstrate this? You only uh, collect minimum information that is required to achieve the purpose. So, for example, if you're in HR, I mean, if you're simply getting information from candidates, do you really need to get their social security number right away? Maybe wait until you decide to hire them, right? I mean, um, you, another uh, thing that you can look into, by the way, is you look into your forms and check the sensitive personal information that you're trying to collect because you, you want to try to minimize it as much as possible so that you can manage your privacy risk. All right. Again, the three data privacy principles are transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality. It is important to remember this because if you know these three data privacy principles, it will be easier to comply with the Data Privacy Act because the provisions are practically anchored with these three data privacy principles. Okay, another obligation under the DPA is, of course, to uphold the rights of the data subject. Okay, now, what are the rights of the data subject? The data subject has the right to be informed, the right to object to the processing of their personal information under reasonable circumstances. They have the right, they have the right to access personal information about them, right to correct or rectify information about them. They have the right to erase. Again, this is, of course, under reasonable circumstances. Right to damages, right to data portability, or right to request under reasonable circumstances, uh, inform copy of information about them. And finally, the right to file a complaint. The PICs, by the way, are required to inform the data subjects about the rights that they have under the DPA. So normally, when you look into data privacy con consent forms uh, or data privacy policies, these uh, rights are included. Another obligation under the DPA is to implement security measures. Now, there are three security measures under the DPA. Number one is organizational, technical, and physical. How do you demonstrate compliance with organizational security measure? 
One example is to appoint a data protection officer or a compliance officer for privacy. How about technical security measure? An example is uh, data encryption. And uh, finally, for physical security measure, um, example is use of proper storage or filing of personal data. Okay, so here are the penalties under the Data Privacy Act. So you can see penalties not only include fine, it also includes jail term. Minimum of one year and maximum of six years and a fine of 500,000 pesos up to 5 million pesos. Now let's have a short quiz. Okay, so uh, on top of this, um, for those who will answer the questions correctly, um, we will be giving a free consultation with attorney EJ. That's a 30 minute free consultation related to data privacy. So if you know the question, uh, type it on our chat box. Okay, question number one is, what are the three data privacy principles? Okay, time is up. Do we have some person who typed the answers right? There's actually just one. Yeah, there, there's one. Okay. So we're looking for, okay, they're still typing. You sh uh, your answer should be complete, okay? Net Pacific Inc. is typing it one by one. So <laughs> we also have Arnold. Okay, the answer is... Transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality. So Arnold Ablaza got the right answer. So Arnold, if you want to arrange a call with us, um, we will reach out to you. So you could uh, uh, we could look on our mutual availability for a free consultation with Attorney AJ. Don't worry, there's still more questions to go. Okay, thank you, Arnold, and for those who tried answering it. So you have to type fast. <laughs> okay, next question. Which government agency is responsible for the enforcement of the Data Privacy Act? And this is quick and easy. Okay, so I don't think I need five seconds for this question. Okay, time's up. The answer is the National Privacy Commission or the NPC. So the person who got it right is Nathan from TCAP. Okay, congratulations, Nathan. Again, um, let us know of your availability. We could schedule a free consultation with attorney E. J. Third question refers to an individual whose personal information is being processed. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Time's up. So the right answer is data subject. It's Ellen, Arnold, Arnold again. Arnold, can we just make it as a loser turn? <laughs> so you won't have a two consultation. So the next one who got the right answer is Ellen, Ellen Luby. Okay, so Ellen Luby, congratulations. Okay, let us know of your availability. Let's have a, a schedule a call with attorney AJ from Carpal Law and associates. Once again, thank you for participating in our quiz. So we will move forward to the next portion of this presentation. Attorney EJ. Previous slide, please. Previous to previous. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now let's proceed with uh, five pillars of data privacy, accountability, and compliance. Okay. Five pillars are number one, you need to appoint a data protection officer. Number two, you implement data privacy security measures, create a privacy management program, conduct a privacy impact assessment, and lastly, be ready in case of a data breach. Okay, now, what is a data protection officer? The data protection officer or DPO is individual or individuals accountable for ensuring the PIC or the PIP's compliance with the DPA. It's implementing rules and regulations. NPC issuances, and other applicable laws. Okay. Now, why do you need to appoint a DPO? Of course, number one, it's a legal requirement. Number two, it is for the organization to achieve compliance and accountability. What are the general principles 
in appointing a DPO. Number one is the responsibility lies with the PIC or PIP and not with the DPO. Of course, not with the DPO alone. The DPO merely helps the organization comply with the DPA, but it doesn't mean that all the responsibility in data privacy compliance rests on the DPO alone. Number two is the DPO must have an autonomy in the performance of his or her duties. And lastly is the confidential nature of the position of a DPO. What are the roles and functions of a DPO? First, to monitor compliance, ensure the conduct of privacy impact assessment or PIA, advice regarding complaints and or exercise by data subjects of their rights, ensure proper data breach and security incident management, inform and cultivate awareness on privacy and data protection within the organization, advocate for the development, review, and revision of policies relating to privacy and data protection by adopting a privacy by design approach, serve as the contact person of the organization vis-a-vis data subjects, the NPC, and other authorities and matters related to data privacy, and cooperate, coordinate, and seek advice of the National Privacy Commission regarding matters related to privacy, among others, of course. Okay. Now, registration with the NPC. Who must register? Any professional or organization must register if, number one, it has 250 or more employees. Number two, it processes sensitive personal information of 1,000 or more individuals. Number three is its processing may likely pose a risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects. Now, the National Privacy Commission issued circular number 22, 2022-04 last December 2022. The effectivity of the circular is January 11, 2023, and all covered PICs and PIPs must now register through the National Privacy Commission registration system within 180 days from the effectivity date or until Jan July 10, 2023. So it used to be that uh, the organization submit printed copies of documentary requirements for the registration and uh, or email a copy of this to the NPC. But now, uh, the NPC will no longer accept the, uh, uh, the printed documentary requirements. With the NPC circular number 2022-04, uh, the DPOs or authorized representatives of the organization must use the NPCRS for the registration of the entities. Okay, now what, why should you register? Of course, number one, it is a legal requirement. Number two, it's good for company brand and reputation. It boosts compliance readiness, avoid complaints, and last but not the least, and I believe this is the most compelling reason to comply with the DPA, it's to avoid hefty penalties provided under the law. I believe this is my last slide. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Okay, thank you, Attorney EJ. We were actually going to open the portion for the Q&A. So if you have any questions that you have in mind, uh, please use this time, type it on our Q&A. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And by the way, I'm from Carpal and Associates. Um, just in case you will be needing assistance in registration with the NPC, drafting of the data privacy notices and data privacy policy, drafting of data privacy consent form, or an or assistance in the conduct of privacy impact assessments, which is very necessary, especially for those starting organizations, you could reach out to Carpal and Associate and they'll be happy to discuss their services on how you could comply to data uh, to, to NPC with this legal requirement by the NPC. Okay, so do, do we already have questions here? Okay, I think we have one question. Um, I'll read the question at our EJ. So um, a local company have the following GDPR. Is this really incorporated into the local law? 
So what do you mean by GDPR, Arnold? Or Attorney AJ, could, could you know? Yes, I uh okay. So the GDPR is actually a foreign law. This is a foreign data protection law that is it is not yet incorporated in the uh, Philippine law. So uh, actually, GDPR is a newer privacy law compared to the Data Privacy Act mm-hmm. of 2012. However, uh, the the law that was uh, in place before the GDPR. This is actually the privacy law for the European European Union or in the EU. Now, the, the law before the GDPR, it was, was actually used by our legislators as a pattern uh, to create our Data Privacy Act of 2012. So there are similarities, but they're not entirely the same. Although if you know the Data Privacy Act, it is, you know, I mean, it is easier for you to understand the uh, uh, provisions or the laws in place in the European Union about the privacy. Um, so again, to answer the question, do local companies have to follow GDPR? Uh, the answer is it depends. If, if you are considered a covered entity under the GDPR, then yes. Is this already incorporated into the local law? No, it is not considered as incorporated into the local law because uh, the Data Privacy Act of 2012 is a different law from the GDPR. Okay, thank you, Attorney We actually have one more question here, anonymous attendee. Question, who is the default DPO of a company in the absence of an appointment? Uh, There's no such thing as a default DPO in a company. Uh, There has to be an appointment because, uh, you know, actually a document that shows an appointment of a DPO is one of the requirements by the National Privacy Commission for the registration of the said DPO. So there is no default DPO, but uh, if, if your question is basically who is usually appointed as a DPO, um, when in the early years, a few years ago, maybe five years ago, when the uh, <laughs> implementing rules and regulations of the DPA was, uh, took effect, I think that's around 2017 or 2018, uh, normally the, the companies would appoint the IT persons because they are the ones uh, who are uh, handling the data processing systems of the companies. Uh, some companies also appointed their legal counsels because of their knowledge about the law, which uh, you know makes it easier for them to understand and share information about the DPA within their organization. So, but there, there's no default DPO. I mean, any anybody who is able and willing can be appointed as DPO of the company because it comes with the risk, right, <laughs> Attorney yeah. Jay? Yeah. Okay. So we also have more questions here. Um, another one from anonymous attendee is for a foreign corporations with branch office in the Philippines, may we appoint a foreigner or an officer based abroad? Um, example, um, she is or he is residing in the US or Europe or in Singapore to be appointed as a DPO. If yes, how can we register such person? Do we need a notarized copy of the registration form? I don't think there is a restriction for citizenship in the appointment of a DPO. So I think it is possible to appoint a foreigner mm-hmm. as a company's DPO. Um, the requirem- for the requirements, there are a few documentary requirements and we can we can assist you um, I mean, offline na lang siguro. We can assist you offline. We can give you a list of the uh, documentary requirements for the appointment. Okay. So we, we still have a few questions here, attorney. This one is very technical from Mark Igman. Um, I'm not sure if attorney Eiji could answer this. Meta says, Meta is the new Facebook uh, company group, right? Um, says that a privacy dispute on Facebook, we should settle in the U.S. District Court or for Northern District of California. Let's say we have filed a case locally against the company, a case of FB moderator not deleting a post that contains private info, but FB didn't comply with the local ruling. What would happen? I think this is a litigious case already. Just in, yeah, um, yeah. So it has to go with a litigation, right, Attorney Jay? 
Yes, I think we'll have to make a few presumptions here, and I'm not sure if this is still uh, within. I mean, and not sure if this is within the scope of our discussion. So, yeah, I believe so. We can answer this offline. Yeah. Okay. Another one, Attorney EJ, can you still answer more questions here? Because it's it's pouring around now. So we have from Nathan from TCAP. We have a we have terminated an employee in the company due to fraud. As part of our strict implementation of anti-fraud, we have disclosed through announcements the termination of employee, her name and cause of termination. Is this a violation of the Data Privacy Act? Okay. Well, um, this is a sensitive mm. topic actually, because this can be uh, subject to a legal dispute. I mean, I think it will depend on how the disclosure is made, mm -hmm. how the announcement is phrased, because as we mentioned earlier, any offense committed or alleged to have been committed by a person is considered as a sensitive personal information. So mm -hmm. technically, if we apply that, the consent of the data subject has to be obtained. So... Um, again, my answer here is it depends on how the announcement is made, or I mean, the, it depends on the contents, rather, of the announcement. Mm. Okay. So next question, Attorney EJ. So when does a person become the PIC? Based on definition, PIC is a person or organization? A person becomes a PIC if the person itself is processing personal information um, not based on the instruction of another person or an entity. So, for example, if you are a professional, if you are a medical practitioner or a lawyer and you are processing personal information of your clients for your own business or for the practice of your prof profession, then you are considered as a personal information controller. Okay. There's actually a follow through from Nathan from TCAP. It is for a legitimate purpose, the announcement of the termination of the employee. Uh, yes, that is actually a uh, good defense. That it is for <laughs> a legitimate purpose. But the, the legitimate purpose is merely a principle, right? So it is, it, it's, a, it's just a principle in the Data Privacy Act, but uh, it is not necessarily a catch all phrase to be uh, used as a defense in processing personal information, right? So there are other provisions to be considered. There are other laws to be considered as well. So there are, there are other angles that we need to look into um, for us to make a definitive answer or a judgment regarding your case. We can discuss this more offline yeah, if you need a... Uh, Legal advice. Okay. So I think we have last question here for Mark again. So according to the Data Privacy Act of 2012, we have the right to ensure of our information, but banks do not comply most of the time. You have already asked for your online bank account deletion, but they are saying that they will keep the info for security purposes. Is their reasoning valid even if you don't have any violations or dispute on your account? Well, uh Again, I mentioned earlier that the data privacy, I mean, the, the right of a data subject to the erasure of their personal information must be made under reasonable circumstances. So um, you mentioned that uh, banks do not comply, but actually banks also have to comply with AMLA regulations. And under AMLA regulations, uh, there has, they have to comply with the record keeping provisions or the record, record keeping provisions under the Anti-Money Laundering Act or, and regulations, wherein they should uh, keep the records of their clients and their transactions for at least 10 years. Okay. I think that's common, five to 10 years retention of records of, of corporation. I, 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 th I think we need to answer this one because I'm also concerned about this other attorney, EJ, from anonymous attendee, anonymous attendee. We have okay. less than 250 employees and we process less than... 1,000 individuals in our branch in the Philippines. Globally, we will meet those requirements. Do we need to register to NPC? When you say globally, we will meet those requirements, meaning that um, you probably have... there, 
probably their office here in their branch office in the Philippines only cater small data sets. So, but regionally, probably when combined with their parent company, let's say perhaps they will meet that. Do they still need to register to the NPC? Yeah, they may need. They may still need to register with the National Privacy Commission in that case. In mm-hmm. the event that they are not really considered as a corporate, there as a corporate entity, there is such thing as voluntary registration. Mm-hmm. Actually, so you can still register. You know, just to ensure that uh, you also practice uh, data privacy, uh, good practices within your organization. Yeah. Okay. So um, anyone can just register. Well, if you are a PIC, yes. If you're considered a PIC, yes, you can register. And uh, actually, um, in the recent circular issued by the National Privacy Commission, if you are not, if you think that you are not considered as a, a covered entity, um, the the NPC requires you to file or to request for a certificate of exemption. So the the, the National Privacy Commission has a certain form that you have to fill out, uh, so that you will be uh, certified uh, as an exempted uh, entity or organization in the registration with the NPC. Okay, so I think that's the last questions we have for this. So um, this uh, webinar is very timely because uh, data privacy is not new, but the implementation of NPC is really moving. And sometimes I think I've heard that other companies being audited, especially if they receive a complaint, the NPC with data leakage. So again, if you need help and assistance in registration with the NPC, drafting of your policy, drafting of consent form, assistance in the privacy impact assessment, you could reach out to Carpool and Associates and Motor Agent will be happy to help you with that because they are, that's part of their service roster in Carpool and Associates. And in case you will need any corporate solutions, uh, payroll, accountancy, uh, Business registration, PESA, and BOI application, feel free to reach out to Incorp Philippines. So this actually ends our webinar. Um, I just have a few more reminders. Um, we will be sending the feedback form. And once we receive your feedback, we will share you the copy of the presenters or the deck we use. And the recording of this video will be uploaded on our official YouTube account in Incorp Philippines, just in case your friends miss this webinar, they could just rewatch it. We will send an, uh, an updates if the uh, video is already uploaded. So once again, thank you for your time. We are looking forward to see you again. We will be creating more webinars to educate our corporations and people on how they could comply with regulatory and compliance in our government offices. My name is Sherwin Urbano. I'm the business growth head in Inco Philippines. So if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out. Thank you, everyone.